Hey, I'm gonna try this out. I picked this sucker up the other day. Look at that thing. You wanna, oh, ah, ow, don't do that. All right, you ready? Look at what you can see now. Hey, welcome to Vortex Garage in the next chapter on our 2004 WJ Grand Cherokee. Now I can tell you from the initial mechanical inspection that we did, the rear brake line, like most WJs, is pretty suspect on this one. Since they pretty much all go, at least in this climate, I'm going to go ahead and proactively replace that because it's looking pretty grungy and pretty rusty in the back. So I figured that's probably where we're going to have to start. Before I get to do the easy stuff like swapping brakes out, I'm going to have to pull this thing out and go ahead and take care of it. Now there's a few different ways you can go about doing this. You can buy preformed brake lines, and I've done that uh, once, <laughs> and they didn't quite fit. Um, but they went in fairly easily. I wasn't entirely thrilled with them, to be completely honest with you. They were not OEMs. The OEMs don't make them anymore. Uh, the next thing you can do is go ahead and take the line out, go ahead and make your own, and that's probably what we're going to do today. And the third option is you can take the line, find out where the rust is, cut it midway, put a flared union, no compression fittings, you got to use double flare unions, and you could just union and do the back half of it. Um, that's an option, but personally, if I'm going to do this, I want to do it 100% right, and we're going to go ahead and put a brand new brake line in that we're going to custom bend. So that's what we're going to start with today, and well, better get started. I'm going to take this dinky little camera and just show you a couple things really quick. All right, so to get started, what we're going to do is uh, we're just going to show you this ABS block really quick. And uh, essentially what you've got here is two inputs. And uh, let me just let me walk you through what these inputs are. So if you look here on your master cylinder, this is where the brake fluid would be outputted as you press the brake. This one here goes right to this one. And then this one back here loops up and goes down into this one. So these are your inputs. Now this is your front side circuit. So these two lines here are your output that go to either front wheel. And then your rear has a single output that splits at the back of the Jeep. And uh, that's this one right here. So this is the line we're gonna be replacing. This is a 12 millimeter hex. You're gonna wanna use a flare wrench or a flare crow's foot, and that's what we're gonna use. Um, so to get this off, you're gonna have to pop up this clip here hard to do one-handed. See right here? And then that's going to free up. And then down in there, I think you can see that. Yep, there's some clips. There they are. You can see those little clips right there. Now basically, those clips kind of like to, you know, they're easy install. You push them in and they, and they go in fine, but they like to grab onto the lines and make it hard to pull out. So we'll try to show you how we do that. All right, now we're underneath our WJ. We're actually on the left side, which in the US is the driver's side. And you can see here, you've got a number of lines that come down the side. Well, this one at the top, this 3 16 line is your rear brake line. And it comes to right here. And this is where it comes into the first rubber line that then distributes it to the two brakes in the rear. So one thing I've seen on just about every WJ that I've worked on is right in this last six inches or eight inches of length is where you end up having rust problems. I don't know if it's just how moisture and road debris sort of lands here, um, but it's usually this last bit here that ends up going. Now this one's not too bad, though I do see there's a little more rust here. And basically anytime you have one of these little fittings, moisture gets trapped behind them. So some of the most pervasive spots you'll find rust is behind these plastic clips. And, uh, and right around this joint. So whenever I've had them break, it's usually been here forward. Though on this one, I can see this is pretty chunky and nasty back here as well. And in fact, going all the way up, there's a lot of rust in one of these up here. I'll show you with the other camera. So just so you can kind of see here, this is where the fitting goes in. And this actually is not a metric fitting. I'm pretty sure this is an SAE fitting. And you can kind of see where there's some crustiness on this line. But if you look here, look at how crusty it is there. But then look in there, that little inch. You see how it's sort of darker there? Like there's more rust there than there is anywhere else. That's usually where they go. It's because moisture gets trapped in those plastic pieces. But moisture also gets, you know, just lands up on these things as you're driving. And this is pretty much where I've seen most of the breaks happen. Now, if we follow our line back, 
we can see once again, we have another one of those things. Look at the, the difference. See how much rust is in that? Okay, we move up forward. It starts to look a lot cleaner. But again, look, look at the rust. <laughs> so like I said, those things are just problematic when it comes to these brake lines. Um, nothing you can do about that, but swap it with a nice quality brake line and it'll give you many, many years of service. As you can see here for all the fuel stuff, they've used stainless steel and melts in great shape. But stainless steel is kind of difficult and expensive to use for lines and for brakes, a lot of times they just use mild steel. It is what it is. Now when you buy a replacement line, you can buy steel, you can buy coated steel, and you can get nickel copper. Yes, you can find stainless steel sometimes, but you probably want to get those pre-made because stainless steel is exceedingly difficult to do a double, double flare. I think most of the times you do single flares with uh, stainless. Um, so if you don't get a manufactured one, it's usually very challenging for folks at home to do that. Um, but as you can see here, up behind the transfer case where our front drive shaft is, we've got another one of those plastic clips. So when we go to remove this line, obviously we're gonna take it off the ABS pump, but then we need to unhook it back here. Obviously have a drain pan for anything that leaks out and then we're gonna need to pop it out of every single one of those plastic clips. And you can see how it likes to grab it. It's great for installation, super easy. Push it in and it pops in. You're gonna to wanna to use a screwdriver on either end of that to push those in and you can pop the line out. Now, don't be tempted to just cut the line. That is easy if you've got a nice replacement ready to go in. But if you're like us and you're planning to bend the line yourself, you wanna keep this line as intact as possible and with all the bends as possible. Uh, easy to see so you're not twisting them too much so everything's nice so we can bend a matching line and then go and reinstall it now a lot of the aftermarket ones will come in two pieces they'll usually have a union right about here somewhere along here and this is where a lot of people also say well i'm just gonna make a union and only do the back half where it broke but as you can see here this is why i don't necessarily recommend that i mean each one of these you got rust and that's the chance for breaking later on so we're just going to knock the whole thing out and we'll be in good shape. I mean, even look up here, this on the other side here, that line is just crusty the whole way. Yes, it's better right here. So I suppose you could say, all right, well, I'll union it right here. Well, that's a fair amount to do back there. And well, you look up here, it's not bad. Okay, this one actually looks pretty good, but sometimes even in these, you'll see rust. So that is certainly an option that some people do. And if you're gonna do that, well, you gotta make sure you use a proper flared union. And again, no compression fittings. All right, since we're back here, I've gone ahead and sprayed this with some penetrating oil and uh, we're gonna go ahead and remove that. We're gonna use a 3 8 flare wrench on the top and we're gonna hold this line so we don't twist or break anything. And we're gonna hold that with a 5 8 That was really easy. I feel like we got really lucky on that. Get your drain pan ready. Oh, I cut it in the drain pan on the first try. That's spectacular. Block your light. But basically, I'm just going to come in here, push that one out of the way. There we go. So there's not too much of a trick to it. Um, you can do them by hand a lot of times, but if you can just sort of get this started with a screwdriver and sort of push that thing up, and then you can sort of slide the line by it. See, we got the top one pushed around. Now the bottom one's kind of grabbing it. So if we come in here, pop our screwdriver, and we pop it out. So I know it, it sounds easier than it probably is gonna be when you go to do it. And these are the easiest because you got a lot of room. So practice on these. And you can just yank them out, but these things are plastic and uh, you do risk breaking them. So I prefer to just take my time. I'm not on the clock. The only clock I'm on is my own. So I get to take my time and have fun. Yeah. Bend and break lines, that's a good time. All right, so now we got our brake line out and loose. I'm gonna do the other ones under here and then we'll lower the Jeep, get it up and do the same thing up top.
I hope the image quality of this crappy little camera is good. I should have just grabbed a GoPro. But this thing has zoom, so it makes it kind of handy. So basically, we've pulled it out of this one, and we've pulled it out of all these. As you get further up, you're gonna see you've got in the wiring loom here, it actually, the wiring loom actually connects to your hose in two places, here and here. And as you can see, they're simple little clips. Those should come out pretty quickly and easily just by hand. See, there's one, and the other one I'll get once I put this camera down. And then you do have a, so careful this, this is your axle vent which goes up and I think it lands on the shock tower, but if you need to, you can move this out of the way to get some room. And you can kind of see there's another gripper right here. And this one's nice because it's hard to reach from up top. If you can get underneath it well, you might be able to get, reach it better. So that's what we're gonna do. Hopefully you can see that one right there. We got you the ultimate today. We're doing the hat cam. All right, you get to see what I see. And here's what I see. I see a 12 millimeter crow's foot is going to work really well. Now you could use a 12 millimeter flare wrench as well. I find the crow's foot really works good. Should be a 12. Yeah, look at that. Look at that. Ah, come on, look at that. Look at that. And I'm going to hit my hat cam on the hood. Then you can just come in here and don't use that. I mean, you could use a stubby if you want, but you just come in here, you get one of these thingies. You set it to off. And you just come around this stuff and watch. Oh yeah, just like that. Didn't even mangle it. Now I've cleaned this off, so I'd recommend you do that. You don't want to get dirt and grime in there. And we'll probably put a vacuum cap in this thing when we're done. But look at that little bubble flare. All right. Now that we got that working, I'm going to stand on this little cart here. And I'm going to show you that you need to reach all the way. Oh, I didn't need a light. I need a better light for you. Hey, I'm going to try this out. I picked this sucker up the other day. Got the old Christmas time Harbor Freight gift card, and uh, I used it for lighting so that you and I could both see. Look at that thing. You want to, oh, ah, ow, don't do that. All right, you ready? Look at what you can see now. Oh, that thing's hot. Uh, aluminum, hey, that's steel. The problem is there's no steel to mount the damn thing on. Maybe the uh, brake booster. As long as I don't get in the way of myself. All right, there we go. So we got a leaf in the way. Basically, we got to come down and yank this line out of where it goes. And it is the back one. So you're saying I got to use the same tools. Fine. I didn't, ow, God. I really scratched up my thumb somehow today. Can you believe it? I just got it. I just got it. We got this out of the way. Now our line is loose. Line's completely loose. Now good luck getting it out of there. All right, so, yep, yeah, see how we got that off there. And keep dirt out of it. I'm just gonna drop that little sucker in there. Probably do a bigger one. How about that? Okay. Those little vacuum cap assortments are just handy. You can use them to fix vacuum leaks and put caps on vacuum, or you can use them to temporarily block off that port so you don't get dirt in it. Look at that. And that's nice and tight. That's not just going to fall out. So now the hard part of all of this is you have to now get this line out of here or down out of there, and that's not going to be easy any which way you slice it. I think we're best to go from underneath down, but we're gonna see. All right, so looking under here, you're gonna see why a lot of the aftermarket companies split them in two, because it's just easier to route them because of the cross member. 
and how long this thing is. So what I'm not sure about is if we're going to go underneath or if we're going to go up the top. But the first thing we got to do is get this one past here. So I should just be able to flex and bend and twist without twisting the line too much. Just pop that out like that. Now this whole thing is sitting down. Look, oh, up, oh, up. Oh. Put your drain pan back. There you go. Up, oh, move your drain pan. There you go. Look at that. We're not making too big of a mess. So now the question is, because it's been many, many, many years since I've had to do one of these, will this prefer to feed up and out? I think it might. And there's no simple way to tell you to do this, except to just fiddle, fart, and try. to you could unplug this wheel speed sensor which I'm pretty sure that's what that is yep wheel speed sensor and you can route these lines out of your way because they kind of cradle the thing so we're going to get that out of the way and that should buy us a little more leeway yeah look at that that really freed up some space now I think we're best to go up from the top at this rate if you look here, I think we're going to pull through the top pretty well. So let me pull it down one more time. We'll test that assumption. We'll see if I'm right. All right, let's see if that's how this will work. So you see our vent tube is kind of blocking us a little bit, but not too horribly. There we go. Just push the vent line on the other side of it. There we go. Just pull up, pull up and through. Where are we stuck? Okay, we're stuck on our brake booster and our metal line here. All right, we're stuck down there. Oh yeah, we got it now. We're in the straight, straight and narrow. Oh, hitting, hitting hat cam. Four slices of burnt toast and a rotten egg. What do you want that for? I got a tape wire and it's good enough for him. Oh yeah, that's got her. All right, here we go. And, uh, Putting it back is reverse of removal. All right, so here we are with our old line, as you can see here. We've got it laid out in a nice area we can work, and what we're gonna do is replicate every single one of those bends. Now, the hardest part to doing this is that you have to think three-dimensionally. This pattern indicates two-dimensional thinking. But what that essentially means is you're not just bending something, oh, I gotta bend it, uh, 90 degrees or 45 degrees, but you have to bend it at the correct rotational plane of this line. So as you look down the side of it, you'll see, for instance, this bend is not at the same angle as this bend. This bend shoots out this way, whereas this bend shoots that way. So you need to take that into account as you're going, and that can make this, frankly, a little mentally taxing as you're doing it, and, uh, well, you can screw it up quite a bit too. So here we're gonna split the video up a bit. If you wanna learn about the tools, processes, and tips for bending and flaring a line, well, we'll have a bonus video with all that. But for those of you who just wanna watch this work, we'll speed through this and cut out all that while linking to the bonus video with details. Now, believe it or not, this was my first time using nickel copper line. I usually use PVF coated steel and well, this stuff, nickel copper, is super easy to bend. I mean, it's almost too easy. Whereas steel, I'm using the tubing bender for most of the bends, this stuff I could largely hand form. 
Now some bends I did need the tubing bender to avoid a kink, and well, this stuff does kink fairly easily if you try to make too tight a radius, but otherwise it's definitely much easier to form. Now I found that zip tying it to the original line was a great way to have it follow the template, but also was something that would come in really handy later on. All right, so we're just about ready to start. We've got our tubing bender in the vise here, and we've got our two dies that we're gonna use. Well, the two halves of the dies, but we're gonna use both sides of this die. So if you look at this, which hopefully you can see on the, on the uh, one here, uh, well, we'll flip them inside out and you can kind of see there's two differences. You have your 45 degree SAE double flare and your DIN ISO flare, ISO bubble on the other side. Um, so see the little dot there? Make sure you get these lined up. Now this is the die for 3 16 or 4.75 millimeter. And uh, this would be the side you want to do if you want to do your uh, double flare for the one end. And then we'll flip it around to do our bubble flare on the other end. So let's start with the double flare. We'll go ahead and lock this in place. As you can see here, we use this kind of operation zero here. See, look, we got our tube nut on. We didn't forget it. This is our, our SAE side. We're gonna cinch this down. And that's gonna level our tube. Now we're gonna do a 45 degree double flare. So we wanna do op one on 3 16 Perfect. Then we'll move to operation two for 3 16 one force or etc. cetera, until it stops. And that should be a perfect flare. It's literally that simple. Look at that flare. Look at our flare nut goes right up on it. Oh yeah, yeah, it looks good. We're gonna go ahead and get this set. Din flare, din flare. Up zero, snug it down. Got our tube nut. We're going to do op one, the 4.7 din. And that should be it. Let's see if we have a, a flare. We have a bubble flare. Look at that bubble flare. And there is our bubble flare put on. So now all we have to do is rebend this back down. We'll use our bending tool and uh, we'll be able to put this on the car. So aside from being a little unwieldy and looking goofy with zip ties all over it, we are about ready to finalize this and go ahead and reinstall it on the Jeep. Now, uh, as again, the zip ties and keeping this thing connected, well, it just makes it easier to lug this thing around. The nickel copper is so flexible the original steel hose, the steel line, gives it a little more strength. Now I'm gonna see if I can leave the zip ties on and feed this thing into the Jeep. Um, hopefully that's the case. I know there's some tight fits, um, but I'm hoping that'll keep me from deforming the nickel copper too much and get this thing back in. So that's not gonna be an easy thing necessarily, and it's hard to verbally say how to do it. I would say you just try it and you get it to work. You probably want two people, someone up top, someone on the bottom, and uh, when things aren't going, don't just jam it and push it. Stop and figure out which way you need to twist it. All right, now when you're gonna put this back on, don't lay it across your battery terminals. I didn't do that, but I almost did it. And then I thought about it and I said, hey, you shouldn't do that. All right, so I'm gonna put these gloves on now because I have equipped this with super sharp things every six inches because I cut the tails off the zip ties. That was very smart. And uh, what I'm gonna do is try to feed this thing back down kind of where it went. And uh, yeah, wish me luck. Make sure you feed the right end first. And it looks like we need to go behind the steering. There, and then we can feed it down. And then under our Jeep.
we're definitely hitting on something. So what we can do, we can just bring our Jeep up. All right, right there we can see where we're getting hung up. And uh, this is where having two people would be great because you could just have somebody down here helping to pull this through. And now we're clear. We should be able to pull it through pretty good. Now I gotta get it up over our drive shaft. Start pulling it through here. All right. Now we could use a ladder, get up there, and look at that, we got it up on the ceiling. Okay. So now we're back up here and we can see where we're binding and how we can maybe push this through. We need to twist it around. There we go. So you might end up bending it a little bit, but just kind of be careful as you go. All right. Back up. Try to yank the sucker down. There we go. I freed up a bunch. All right, now if we need to go up top and turn it. At this point, since I didn't bother getting a helping hand, I'm gonna go ahead and use the ladder to save the lift. There, see? Yeah, look at that, see we're caught under the, the master cylinder. This is why it's a little easier if you got two people to kind of work this and pull it through. There you go. Because it doesn't want to go naturally. It wants to be difficult. Back up the ladder. This is where most people on YouTube would speed it up too to make it look more elegant. But it's not. It's literally you pushing this stinking thing through trying to not get it caught up on stuff, trying to not tear things until you finally get it home. And we're close. If you did these every day, like I'm sure a lot of people have, who maybe worked at a dealership or a shop, you probably get really good at threading these things in. Otherwise, you're just doing what you can to get this thing to fit. Sometimes it doesn't want to. Well, we're awfully close. So back up the ladder. Hopefully we just need to twist and turn this thing one more time. You know, one problem, of course, we left our old line connected, but when we're done, we're just gonna cut it. Look at that. There we go. That's pretty much got her. Like right there. All right. Now we just cut the old line into pieces, cut the zip ties, and we can go ahead and remove it. This leaves our fresh new nickel copper line. This is a step I've only had to do with nickel copper since, well, it's not as rigid as steel. <laughs> I mis made an error. I don't think you can see this, but I'm on the other end of the fuel line. So I'm going to have to disconnect this fuel line and uh, slap this up underneath it to get it to fit right because this has to go above that. So 
oopsies. Everyone makes an error from time to time and that would be one of mine. So pay special attention to where the fuel line juts upwards as the brake line should be routed behind this fuel line. If you go in front of it, which it'll want to do, you'll either have to pull the line back up to correct that or take pressure out of the fuel system, pop the quick disconnect, put the brake line behind it and reconnect the fuel line. I know that fairly well because, well, that's what I had to do. Now, finally, we continued going along the route of the new line, pushing into all the factory retainer clips, starting at the ABS pump, working our way back. Don't forget to reattach the ABS sensor wire and the axle vent tube if you moved it. We also fully tightened the fittings on either end. As a reference, the service manual states the lines on the ABS pump torque to 12 foot-pounds or 144 inch-pounds. Now, I couldn't easily locate a torque spec for the flare nuts to the flexible lines, but it seems like it may be the same. Though generally, I like to tighten these by hand. Usually ends up being a few flats past finger tight. You know, tight enough to seat the flare and not leak, but not too tight that you're cranking it on and breaking it. All right, now I wouldn't say it fits perfect, per se. It really doesn't fit bad at all. So we'll just give you a quick view. See, we got our new line in. You can see we're not touching anything. That's one thing you kind of want to look out for. Like I said, we're going for 90% good. Um, well, we want 100% good, but 90% perfect. We don't need true, honest, full per perfection. Um, we just need this thing to work and be safe. And that's what we want to check to do that, is that there's no weird stresses on the line, that the line's not going to vibrate against other lines, that there's this room where it's not touching. I see it's touching here a little bit, so we're going to come in here and I'll push that aside just a little bit. See, this nickel copper is so malleable and easy. You can move it out of the way. Good for me. You can hand form these things easier than you can with that darn tool. And you don't kink them when you hand form nickel copper. That tool is a little better for steel. I'll put it that way. Uh, so we're touching the frame here. So we'll pull that out a little bit. But other than that, here's the fuel line I had to disconnect. Uh, that was a bit of a pain, made a little bit of a mess. But our line otherwise goes up. We're going to reconnect our ABS line, make sure our vent line is routed correctly, which we may even replace eventually anyway. So that's pretty much where we're going to wrap our video for today. That is replacing the rear brake line on this WJ Grand Cherokee. So after using the nickel copper, I got to say, that's really the way to go. Having used steel in the past, having even bought stainless steel reproductions, honestly, the nickel copper, super easy to work with by yourself. You hardly need any special tools for it. If you get yourself a good flaring kit though, you can make both the ISO DIN bubbles and the 45 degree double flares really, really good. We don't have any unions. We have a single now brand new line. It's not touching on anything. It matches the original contours. It connects to every factory point. One thing we did off camera that you missed, I went ahead and rerouted the ABS line, connected that up, that fit as well. So our fit isn't 100% perfect, but it is 90% perfect and there's nothing touching. You know, there's a few spots where it looks a little wavy compared to the original one, but man, it doesn't touch anything. It uses all the factory mounting points. This is a good line. I'm pretty happy with it. What I'm probably going to do is wrap up this video because normally I would do a brake bleed and all that, but well, I'm sure you know how to do that if you've gone this far. And we're not ready to do that ourselves because this was just one step in a larger thing, set of things that we're doing. So we're actually going to flush all of our brake fluid. We're going to replace all of our flexible brake lines. And we're also going to replace all of the brake hardware on this Jeep. So that's going to be a whole separate uh, effort, a uh, separate video. And you can probably catch some of the bleeding in that. But for now, we'll wrap this video up just to be replacing that line and how to bend it and et cetera. And uh, well, hopefully you found it useful. Now, if you liked what you saw, definitely drop us a like, comment, and a subscribe. That helps out the algorithm. You know all that. But if you like this and if you're in the WJ stuff, you'll want to do that because it'll keep you updated on our new WJ content that's coming. As you can tell, we have a lot of jobs planned for this one. Plus, some of the stuff we did on prior WJs is still out there as well. So. We're looking forward to having more for you here on Vortex Garage.